Alrighty, in this video we're going to go ahead and work on the interaction logic of our window. So, as you see right now, we have our awesome view model being instantiated and assigned to our data context, which provides those properties to our window to be bound against for whatever purposes that we see fit. Now we'll see an example of us using the properties in order to bind to visible things, such as our uh, text fields and our progress bar, but also for things that aren't as uh, immediately associated with data binding. For example, whether or not certain controls are active. So the first thing I want to do is get the layout of the form up to what I want it to be. Then I'm going to go ahead and write some really basic test interaction logic. So the interaction logic will essentially be you click a button, the username and password uh, boxes get grayed out, and then the also the button gets grayed out. The progress bar gets activated. Once it's activated, it will fill up, and then our that pretty much is all the interaction logic that we really want to do. After that point, all we have left to do is actually make it do something. Because typically when we do stuff like this, you can either make it do something first and then make it pretty, or work on the UI first and then make it do something. In this case, we're doing the latter. So let's go ahead and get rid of this line of code right here, because it is no longer relevant to our needs. In addition, I will go ahead and make this a read-only um, field. Now, the read-only field really does nothing more than make you feel better about your code. Now, uh, it, it's important. It is. A lot of people will say it's very important because what it essentially assures us is that we're not going to be able to reassign this value to anything else throughout the logic. Of course, if you pay attention to that stuff by default, you won't need the read-only qualifier because you just won't reassign it to anything, but it puts a nice little compiler-level guard against us doing something stupid. And a guard against us doing something stupid is a good thing, in my opinion. So what we're going to do is set that to read only. Alrighty, so now that we've done that, let's jump back over into our XAML and put together our forms. I'm going to go into full screen here, full screen it up, so we get a little bit more screen real estate. It, well, I always get frustrated. I mean, should I do it like this? But let's start off with a vertical split, and I'll move to a horizontal split if our lines become too long, as they typically do in XAML. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to create our uh, progress bar, our status thingy, and our username thing, our password thing, and our login thing. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually resize this window to something a little bit more appropriate for the content that we're putting in it. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of eyeball it, and I kind of like that. And then I'm going to take these numbers up here, the height and the width of the window, and I'm going to set them to some even numbers, like let's say... No, oh, not 2,000. 200 by 350, because I like round even numbers. They make me feel good about the code and about myself and life choices. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and nuke out our label, because we won't be needing that. Then let's go ahead and, and set some grid markers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click the grid right about here, because that's where I want the progress bar to appear. I want the progress bar up on this top row. Uh, we'll round out these numbers here in a moment once we get all of our grid our grid markers in place that we need to. So that's where our progress bar is going to go. Now we need something for our username and our password. So I'm going to take a thing there. So that's our that's our where our username is going to go. Maybe move this up a little bit. Maybe move that up a little bit. Then do another. Uh, maybe move that down. Then do that. And I think that's good. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a vertical split to separate our username and password labels from our username and password fields. So I'm just going to eyeball that right there. So again, I just eyeballed all those values, but then I'm going to go into the XAML, round out the numbers, and get rid of those stars, because those stars indicate how we want the grid to stretch as we resize the window. But as you'll see in a moment, we're going to disable the ability to resize the window, so the stars will be irrelevant, and we'll have a very fixed pixel perfect grid thing, and it'll be very nice. Okay, so our columns, we have two columns, uh, one at 49, we're going to turn that into 50, because 50 is a nice number, I like 50. And then we're going to finish the other one off, actually I'm not going to put a number in here, I'm just going to put in star, 
what that's going to indicate is that means that the, the last column will fill the rest of the space left by that 50 marker. I'm actually not happy now that I look over visually, which is why I like having the XAML and the window side by side. I'm not happy with that 50 right there. Um, I think it'd be a little bit more better if we bump that up to 100. Just give us some more room for our username and password um, labels. Okay, now let's work on our rows. The first row we're placing at 36, I'm going to change that to 40. So our progress bar will be of a height of 40. Then we have the second row. This row will determine the, um, this row right here, I believe, is what we're looking at right there. This row will determine the top of our, um, of our, um, username. And I'm going to set that to maybe 40. Round that out right there. Then we have 26 and 26. Uh, so it looks like I got those measurements pretty close. We want these two numbers to be the same because these will determine the spacing of our username and password form elements. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the star and set these both to 30. So 30 there and 30 there, giving us these nice two very even places where we're going to stuff our username and password fields. And then the final one, just like what we did before, I'm just going to set to star, so it'll fill the rest of the window. And that's the behavior that we're going to want in this case. So now that we have our grid all worked out, we can actually work on our form elements. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to dump in our progress bar. So inside of the grid, as a child of the grid, I'm going to open up a progress bar element. And I'm going to make it a self-closing element. Then I'm going to set the grid dot column span to two. As you'll see, it has the effect of having the progress bar stretch the entire width of the grid. Now you'll notice that it's flush with the window. I'm not sure if I'm a big fan of that, but instead of going and changing my column definitions, I'm going to do something a little bit um, sneaky here. I'm going to go ahead and give my grid some padding. So I'm going to come up here to the grid and I'm going to type in, uh, or sorry, margin. I'm going to give it a margin of 10. So that'll push the grid in from all sides by 10 units, making our elements appear a little bit inset into the form, which gives it a nice feel like that. Okay, so for the progress bar, we're not going to worry about data binding quite yet. We'll do that later so that we don't fill up the width of the screen space I have available. And we're going to go in and go into our Stannis label. So that's just going to be label. Now our label is also going to have a grid dot column span two. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set some content into it. And the reason I'm setting the content into it is so that I can eyeball where the content is going to appear. Where I want the content to appear is in the middle of the progress bar. So let's just put in some arbitrary text so we can eyeball that and get that in. So let's just start off with, I don't know. There we go. That should work. And as you see, it's sitting up here in the top left, which is not what we want. So we can go ahead and because we have content in here, which we will replace with data binding here shortly, but since we have content in here, I can go ahead and uh, eyeball how we want to format this. So for example, I'm gonna go ahead and write in something like content or horizontal content alignment, and I'm gonna set it to center, which will center that up horizontally. Not surprising given the name of the property being horizontal content alignment. Then I'm going to drop down to another line because we're running out of screen space and I'm going to type in vertical content alignment and set that to center. And as you see we get centered text on top of our progress bar. And of course the z-index of our label is going to be greater than that of the progress bar because it appears later. Um, I do believe that if I were to reverse these def declarations the label is hidden by the progress bar. But by keeping the progress bar first, we have it in the center. Okay, so that is our label and progress bar. Again, we'll data bind that momentarily. So now let's go ahead and work on our labels. So we have two labels that we want, our username and password. Actually, I'm going to do it in groups. So I'm going to do the label, then the text box, then the next label, the next text box. So first I'm going to start with the label. And this is not going to be data bound. It's just going to be sent to the content of user name. Then I'm going to say grid.row equals, I think, three? No, two. We want to stick that in two. 
Then I'm going to say horizontal content alignment right, and then I'm going to say vertical content alignment center. So it'll be centered to the right. And you see the label comes with some built-in padding which is really nice, which is why I used the label instead of, for example, the text block, which would have the same effect, except for it wouldn't have this nice built-in padding. But as you see, we get some padding from the right-hand side there, which makes this um, fit exactly the way we want it to. So let's go ahead and do our text box. So I'm going to say text box to instantiate a text box control. I'm going to say grid.row equals 2 and grid.column equals 1 which will result in that text box filling up this entire grid row. Now that isn't exactly what we want. I do want some space. So to make some space, I simply set the margin to let's say five, which will give that text box a nice little padding around that grid cell right there. All right, let's go ahead and do the same thing for our password field. I'm gonna say label content equals password. I'm gonna make this a self-closing element. I'm gonna set the grid.row to three horizontal content alignment to right, vertical content alignment to center. We have our password label. Then to create our password box, we, not surprisingly, instantiate a password box. The password box will have a grid row of three and a grid column of one. And it'll have a margin of five. Now, if you know some XAML, you might be saying, why aren't you using styles, Nelson? You could use styles to not have to repeat all these declarations. And my answer would be, this is not a WPF video. Well, it kind of is a WPF video, but we're not going to get into that quite yet. Or perhaps at all. Styles are very nice, but the syntax gets a little unwieldy, unwieldy as XML tends to do. So we're not going to worry about making these into styles. Now you'll notice that I am unfortunately running out of space here because of that margin that I added in uh, earlier to our grid. We don't have enough space for our button. It's easy to fix. All I gotta do is take the width and bump it up a little bit. The width of the window, that is. Maybe in addition, I could uh, get the username and password just a little bit closer to the status um, text box. So to do that, I could do a couple of things. I could remove one of these row def definitions, this, this 40 guy right here. I could just nuke him entirely, which might be what I want to do. So I'll take that and I'll nuke it. And then I'll set these uh, labels and text boxes, I'll set their rows to one and one, and then grid row two and two. So you'll notice I moved everything up. And you know what? I'm actually kind of a fan of that. I guess we don't even need the spacing uh, between the progress bar and the form. I think that looks fine. Okay, so now let's go ahead and put in our button. So at the bottom, I'm going to instantiate a button. I'm going to say it's grid.row to three. It's grid.column to one. And then I'm going to say it's margin to five. It's content to login. And then I'm going to set its, uh, let me see. So there's a variety of things that we can do here. I'm not a fan of it looking like that. Kind of want to unlock it from that position and bring it back a little bit. I don't want to specify a, a width at all. So let's take off the width. Okay, there we go. So just by setting its horizontal alignment to left, we see that it no longer fills the entire width of that row, which is what I want to have happen. But we'll have to compensate for some padding. So I'm going to take the padding and I'm going to set it to 10. That looks good. Now you notice it is a little bit, a little bit tall. And the reason why it's tall is because it is um, filling the entire width of this grid row, which means we can do a couple of things. What I'm going to do in this particular case is I'm just going to reduce the size of the window. Because remember, this last row is a star height. And because it's a star height, it means it's going to fill in the rest of the space that hasn't been filled in yet by the rest of our grids, or our grid rows and columns. So by reducing the height of the window, we reduce the amount of space the grid can take up, thus reducing the size, or rather the height, of the final row and thus the button. So to do that, I'm going to come up here. I'm going to maybe change this to, to 325. 
Whoops, that's the width. Derp. Let's change the height to 175. That's too small. Let's go to 180. 180? No, not going to work. 190. You know, actually, I think 190 would be good, except we have a padding problem. Notice how the padding is basically making the content of the button disappear. That's actually really easy to fix. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here to padding, and I'm actually going to specify the padding in four numbers rather than one. See, what we see here is an example, or rather two numbers instead of one. What we see here is an example of a uniform padding, where it's going to apply a left, right, top, and bottom padding of 10. But just like CSS, we can break this out into multiple numbers and control the individual uh, sides however we want. So for example, I could say 10, 0, and you see the login thing appears now. So you'll notice we got rid of our top padding, but we gave it, we still gave it the left padding and the right padding. You'll also notice that that's going to be opposite of what you might be used to if you write CSS. But anyway, 10, 0 will give us a left and right padding of 10, and, z or, and a top and bottom padding of 0, allowing us to actually visibly see the word login. Okay, so before we get into data binding and our actual uh, interaction logic, I'm going to go ahead and hit a 5 see how this guy looks. I do believe I forgot to make this window not resizable, so we'll fix that here momentarily. Give it a sec to query. It has to spool up the site on my VM. And we see this. I think this form looks pretty good, other than the whole resizing. But that's cool, we can fix that here. Uh, one thing I do want to do, however, is I want to make this button the default button. What do I mean by default button? Well, if I'm in a form field and I hit enter, I want that to click, quote unquote, the login button. So we're going to make two changes before we test again. And that is, I'm going to go into the button and I'm going to set is default to true, making it so that when we hit enter on any of the other form elements, it will have the effect of clicking the button. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here to the top of our window and I'm going to enter a new line. I'm going to say window style equals, um, actually, no, they did different, didn't they? Resize mode equals no resize. So let's hit a five again and see what we get. All right, we have our login button, and you'll notice that the login button has this nice border around it indicating that it is the default button, and everything seems to work. Um, and we can't resize the window, that's good. Now, there are a couple things that I wanna change. First of all, I really don't want this progress bar to be that tall, and I also want to make these text boxes um, flush with the progress bar. So to do that, we come back here to our window size. Well, first of all, let's go ahead and just readjust our progress bar. So our progress bar is a height of 40 right now. Let's try a height of 20. 25 maybe. I think 25 is good, though we'll need to fix the padding on our uh, label. And we'll also need to fix the height of the window because by reducing the height of this row, we made the um, bottom row take up more space. So we need to reduce the height of the window by 15. So what is 190 minus 15? Well, it's going to be 175, I believe. Okay, so we have that done. Now let's go ahead and fix the padding of our label. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say padding equals zero. Why am I setting it to zero? Well, since we're centering the content, which means putting the content in the center of the element, padding becomes irrelevant and we no longer need to worry about that. So everything is good. Uh, maybe the height of the window could be reduced just, just a tad. Maybe bring it down to one seven. There we go, that looks good. Um, now I wanna make these flush with the um, uh, progress bar, but I want to leave the margin on the left. That's really easy to do. These text boxes, you notice I have a margin of 5. Well, what if I just went in here and did 5, 0, 0, 
zero? No, I don't want that. I want five, five, zero. <sighs> Left, top, okay, five, five, zero, five. There we go. Now you see the text block I box is indeed flush with the progress bar. So five, the first number is the left, next number is top, uh, next number is right, which we set to zero, and the last number is bottom. Again, I know there's probably a bunch of people saying, well, if you made styles out of these, then you wouldn't have to change it twice. Yes, I know. But we're almost done, so I'm not going to. All right, let's go ahead and change our password box to 5505. Five, and let's hit a five. Okay, our window could be made a little bit taller. Um, our text boxes are good. Our button is not good. Our progress bar is good. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set the uh, padding of the the bottom padding of the grid to zero, or bottom margin. So I'm going to say ten for left, ten for top, ten for right, zero for bottom. Then I'm going to hit a five. And I think this is acceptable. Uh, we could tweak this a little bit more, of course. Uh, maybe add some space in between the progress bar and the username and password. That's kind of bothering me because it's inconsistent. But yeah, you can make it as pic pixel perfect as you want based off of what I've shown already. So I think that should be it for making our actual view do what we want. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back to a horizontal split using this button here at the bottom so that we can take a closer look at the code on a wider um, wider screen space. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, I'm going to inline all of these into one line so that it's clear uh, which properties um, apply to which elements for you guys. You guys don't have to do this, obviously. You can format it however you want within the rules of XML, as long as the elements appear in the same order. Okay, so let's go ahead and do our data binding. So our progress bar, I'm going to set a couple properties on it. I'm going to set the maximum to 100, meaning the maximum value of the progress bar is 100. So when I set the value to 0, the progress bar will not be filled at all. When I set the progress bar to 100, it'll be totally filled, which is a very nice little way to handle progress bars. It just makes sense if you normalize it before you hit the UI, as opposed to setting the maximum of the progress bar to something different. It's very much possible that the maximum default of the progress bar is 100. I wouldn't know because I always like to explicitly say maximum 100. It removes any sort of ambiguity in this declaration. Okay, so let's set the value to something. What are we setting the value of? Well, we can set it to 50, and we see it's 50% full, but setting it to a constant value is not going to make a very useful progress bar. Unless you're a Windows developer, in which case, well, pff, like, progress bars don't mean anything in Windows. Um, see the service panel, but let's go ahead and instead of setting this to a constant, set this to the result of data binding, particularly a one-way data binding between our view model into our view. To do that, let's open up some curlies, and I'm going to set the binding to uh, something, to percent. That's a terrible name. Steve, why did you let me name something so terribly? Because I really, really like terrible names. Okay, well, we're stuck with percent. I'm not going to worry about changing it because I don't want to fly around the code base. Anyway, um, a quick note, we could say binding percent or we could say binding path equals percent. It has this exact same effect. In fact, uh, you can specify a variety of additional parameters into a declaration like this, uh, one of them being path or source or whatever. But the default parameter to set is the path. So that, that's why we can just get away with saying binding percent, because this is the most common form of data binding. OK, so we set the binding percent here, so our progress bar will fill up based off our view model, which is really cool. Now let's go into our label and do the same thing with status. So I'm going to say binding status. All right, so now that's bound. Now let's do a two-way data binding. How do we do a two-way data binding? Well, we just go into text box and we say text equals binding username. There's really nothing special about two-way data binding. It is the default value. We could set it up with one-way data binding if we wanted to. But 
by just saying binding username, every time we make a change in our text box to our property, it'll update our object for us, which is really cool. Now on our password box, I'm going to say text equals, oops, text equals binding password, which will bind the, or sorry, it's password equals binding password derp. The password box does not have a text um, property. Uh, binding property comes uh, password box. Uh, well, this seems relatively unfortunate. Hmm. Seems that the password property is unbindable. Hmm. All right. Seems unfortunately we will not be able to bind to the password for security related reasons, according to Microsoft. Although I think that is silly because if a person gains access to your RAM to the point where they can access memory, you have bigger problems than them stealing your password. Also, considering the fact that if they have access to your RAM, they most likely have access to your hard drive. And most browsers leave all of your saved passwords unencrypted on your hard drive, if that doesn't scare you enough to using a password manager like LastPass. Anyway, um, it doesn't seem like we'll be able to bind directly to our password property. So in order to keep things as uh, simple and straightforward as I can, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove that property from our view model and act, unfortunately, give the password box an X name so that we can reference it directly from our code behind. It's not a very optimal solution. Unfortunately, Microsoft, being what it is, decided to be dumb, and now we have to deal with it. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to jump into my main window view model. I'm just going to delete the password field. So I'm going to delete that, come down here, and delete that. Now, the re again, the reason is, is that the password box does not store passwords in plain text on in RAM. It uses the secure password thingy, whatever that is, to st store the passwords, um, which technically encrypts the password um, as much as it can, although I'm sure there are v many attack vectors that you could do because at some point it has to decrypt the password anyway in order to, you know, set its value to something. But because of that, they did not make a dependency property out of password. Because they did not make a dependency property out of password, you cannot bind to it since you can only bind to dependency properties. So instead of setting password to binding password, instead I'm just going to simply say x colon name equals password. And we'll reference it directly within our code. OK, so. That ha that'll handle our binding for our progress bar and our labels. Um, our text boxes and our buttons do need a couple extra things, or at least one new thing. And that is, we want them to enable or disable based on whether or not we have the can login property set to true. So jumping back into our XAML, let's jump into our text box, and I'm going to say is enabled equals binding can login. And it's as easy as that. So now when can login is set to false, is enabled will be set to false, and the text box will be disabled. Let's do the same thing on our password box. Is enabled equals binding can login. And finally, let's do it on our button. Is enabled equals binding can login. And that's it. We should be done with uh, our data binding. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is on my button, I'm going to create a click handler. I'm going to say click equals, and then I'm going to say, how about just login? So when we click on the button, we'll, we will invoke the login method on our code behind. You'll see it's red because we haven't created that method yet. So jumping into our code behind, let's create a new method. So I'm going to come up here. I'm going to say private void login object sender routed event args, which comes from system.windows, e. And that's not how you spell login. Logni. OK, and when we click the button, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set viewmodel.canLogin to equal false. 
And let's go ahead and also say viewmodel dot percent equals fifty and viewmodel dot stannis equals um, stuff happened. All right, so this will give us a nice um, uh, demonstration of our interaction logic to see exactly what's going to go on with our form when we hit the button. Of course, it's not actually doing anything yet, but it'll be close enough for testing purposes. Jumping back into our XAML, let's look it over and make sure that everything here is as correct as it can be. Um, click is login. It's no longer red because we now have that method. We have all our bindings set up. I think we're good to go. So let's go ahead and hit F5 and test out our form. All right, you'll notice that everything is disabled by default. That is a good thing. That means our stuff is working because we never actually set can login to true. And as you know, Boolean's default to false. So jumping back into our code behind, immediately after instantiating our view model, I want to say view model dot can login and set it to true. Now hit F5. Now we see that the username and password is available. Actually, what I'm going to do is instead of saying stuff happened on our uh, status, I'm going to say um, string.format blah blah, where blah is view model username and the other blah is password.password. So this will show us that all of our data binding is working. Now let's hit F5 for reals this time. Type in ASDF and something else, then hit login. And we see our progress bar filled up halfway. Our status was set to ASDF FGH, which is indeed what I typed into password and username. And our login button and our form controls became grayed out, all with three lines of code. So that's really the power of uh, using view models and data binding, because you can really you know, kind of encode the higher level concepts of your interaction logic into a really nice class that you can use later down the road to make very obvious application specific changes to and see those changes reflected in a sane way using your interface. What's also cool about this is we can completely rewrite our view however we wish based off of these pro properties and not have to change any of the logic, any of the actual interaction logic. So that's really cool. We get a lot of cool features. Our code is really clean. And that's going to be the power of data binding. So you can kind of think of this as like a taste of MVVM. If you really wanted to go crazy with it, there are ways to do so. In fact, you can even, like I said before, encode the actual logic of your application into your view model, which is kind of the holy grail of MVVM. But since that actually takes a level of work that I'm not right now willing to do, we're just going to use code behind for our logic and uh, view models for our data, except for our password, because passwords are dumb, apparently. All right, I think that pretty much wraps up what I wanted to do in this video. In the next video, we will actually make our login form do something and have our launcher actually launch. All right, we'll see you guys in the next video.